Welcome to Linda New Arts series of Meet the Artist Sessions. Today's session is being presented in partnership with Lyndon's very good friends at the Melbourne Fringe Festival. We are presenting it to you live today, so anything can happen. Um, the afternoon, we're talking to First Nations multidisciplinary creative, Nicole Monks, and we're really looking forward to introducing to her and getting started. Nicole will discuss her large-scale commission, Burley Lanmaha, or, or Eating Together, that features crockery and cutlery made from traditional materials found on country. This work was commissioned especially for Design Fringe this year. And due to COVID-19's impact on the festival, we'll be showing this work next year. We're just waiting to work out some dates that we can make that happen. So for those of you joining us live this afternoon, you'll be the first to see this stunning new work. If you're joining us live on Facebook and YouTube, there are lots of opportunities to ask questions. So if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment about the conversation, you'll need to log into the platform you're joining us from and use the chat or the Q&A sections. But before I get started, I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. I like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we all virtually meet this afternoon. Today, today I'm joining you from the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation here in Melbourne. And Nicole is joining us from Yamaji country in Western Australia. And I'll get to her in a moment and bring her up on screen. I'd like to pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging. And while we meet virtually this afternoon, tonight draws upon the ancient history of this land and it reflects the millennia of experiences of our first people coming together to celebrate, to make art, to share stories and connect. I'd like to also extend a very warm welcome to any first peoples who are joining us today. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Nicole Monks and I'm going to bring Nicole up on screen now. Hello, Hi, Nicole. everyone. Hi, Melinda. How are you? Very well, thank you. That's good. Thanks for having me here today. Really appreciate it. It's lovely to have you too. Let me tell everyone a little bit about you, Nicole. This is the bit where you'll have to sit humbly and hopefully <laughs> we, get it, we get it right. I know. So you're a multidisciplinary creative of Yamaji, Wanjari and Dutch and English heritage. You're currently living on Yamaji country in Western Australia, but normally you're on the East Coast in Newcastle where your practice is um, um, right. and your business, but you're out on your grandmother's country at the moment. Your practice is informed by your cross-cultural identity. You use storytelling as a way to connect with the past, the present and the future. Your works take a conceptual approach that are embedded with narratives and aim to promote conversation and connection. You're an award-winning designer and artist with work that crosses disciplines into furniture and objects, textiles, video, installation and performance. But you like to call performance activations and we'll get to that in a little bit later. I do, yeah. <laughs> Although these varied forms of contemporary art and design, your work reflects Aboriginal philosophies of sustainability, innovation and collaboration. You're well known for your success as a solo and collaborative artist and founder of design practice Black and White Creative, as well as a public art um, company, Millie Millie, and we'll look at some of your examples today of your public art projects. Sure. You currently sit on the University of New South Wales Galleries Board. You're on the Advisory Council for the University of New South Wales School of Art, Design and Architecture and the Design Advisory Panel for the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney. You're a winner of the University of New South Wales Art and Design Indigenous Professional Development Board, an Arts New South Wales Aboriginal Design Grant, the Vivid Design Competition for Furniture, the Sydney Design Award in Textile and Surface Design. And your work is collected nationally, including at the Powerhouse, the National Gallery of Victoria, the Art Gallery of WA, 
the Museum and of Art and Culture at Lake Macquarie. There's a lot that you've done There's in a such lot. a short time. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there is. There really is. I really do like to um, sort of try my hand in any kind of discipline. I actually find that one of the most exciting things about working across both art and design. Yeah. And, Nicole, what we might do now is we've got a PowerPoint that we can share with people so that people can see some of your fabulous work. And um, I'm just going to, as we do that, swap interpreters. I'll be one moment as I add Paul to the stream. So you've got this huge diverse practice, Nicole, and you've been presenting across Australia. So today we're going to look through some of the images. There's this beautiful photograph of you um, on the screen. In, this ex in these images that will run in the next sort of three slides, it was an exhibition titled We Are All Animals and it was presented at the Museum and Art Gallery of the Northern Territory in 2016 as part of the Telstra Award. The work included installation and also a performance. So, Nicole, tell me about this work. Okay, well, this was a very interesting work. I actually um, developed this work while I was out um, in Barkindji country, so out near Broken Hill. It was part of the, my university um, residency at UNSW and we went out there to a place called Fowler's Gap. And um, while I was out there, it had this really resonance for me because it was an old sheep station and... Um, it had a resonance for me because my family over here in Western Australia had um, been on the biggest sheep station over here. So I was finding all these parallels between um, the spaces in a way that um, it was very much this kind of uh, introduced kind of species of the sheep coming here. But then at the same time, while I was on country, we also came across an expired emu on the side of the road. So there was these native uh, animals and then there was sort of this leftover wool from this introduced animal. And it just had a, a real kind of connection with myself coming from Aboriginal Dutch and English heritage and just trying to find where I sort of fit and my identity. And, you know, I guess, you know, when you sort of talk, you know, Aboriginal um, culture is the longest continuous culture in the world. So I've got that inside me. I've got then, you know, the Dutch that first came down and said, hey, there's a country down here. And then the English who obviously colonised the place. So I have quite a internal dialogue about this quite a lot, about how these all sit sort of within me and how I can kind of um, feel okay about it. But sometimes it feels like I'm just a little bit jammed together and this whole other sort of creature and so what I developed while I was there was basically this wearable kind of um act yeah sort of a wearable kind of suit that was also a sculpture that could also be a video that could also be a photography work um that I wore and then sort of sat in these places so in one place I sat in the shearing shed in one place I went and sat out in country and I just felt what that felt to be like this unidentifiable sort of creature where yeah my identity felt just like quite jammed together it's quite it's quite old this work now I think it's almost a decade old so um yeah but that's at that moment in time there were the thoughts that I was having and there were the feelings that I was going through so while I was out there for the week I wove I wove these two materialities together and then, um, yeah, created the piece, which there you can see in that image is, um, you know, that was the sculpture. So as a sculpture, it was quite uh, a beautiful, interesting, it, it actually had a smell to it and everything like that. So, um, yeah, I, I wove all of the all of the wool actually onto, it was the fly net that I'd taken out there that you'd wear over <laughs> Your, uh, your head to keep the flies off. So I, I just used whatever I could find basically and then I wove all those together and I went and collected all the emu feathers that um, 
you know, from the emu that it had been hit on the side of the road all up and down the road. So I spent sort of days collecting and then days sorting all the feathers because the emu feathers are very beautiful. They actually come as like a two-pronged sort of feather, all of them, which is quite lovely, the only bird to do that in the world. Um, and then they have very soft, very soft under sort of downy feathers, but then their tail feathers actually I've got on right here. I don't know if you can see that, but um, the tail feathers are very kind of almost like stick-like. They're um, very stiff. And so I went through a process of um, sort of um, categorising them all down so that when I placed them onto the work, they were sort of placed in that original order and sort of paid homage, I guess, to the emu in that way that I spent a lot of time with the feathers and the sheep as well. I spent a lot of time, you know, weaving those, um, making the little balls and weaving them together. And then the and the work that came from that was that I would wear this sculpture and um, I would actually create a space where I was sort of creating a little nest because when I went into the sheep station at one point, I saw a bird um, flying around. It was flying around and I was like, oh, no, it's trapped. It's trapped in the shed. You know, how can I help? And then I realised that it actually sort of just stopped and went up and there was a little nest there. And I was like, oh, no, it's not trapped it's actually made its home here. And then that made me sort of look at the work that I was doing and think, you know, it doesn't matter where you are, you can always make a home, you know. So then I started to wear this suit and just make myself like a little, a little home or nest in and find, you know, where I belong. So that, that work, yeah, it was shown, the, the activation of that work was shown up at the Telstra's. The sculpture has been shown in numerous locations as with the videos to that work and the photographs as well have been collected by the Western Australian Gallery. Um, so, yeah, it's had quite a, um, a life in many different aspects and I guess that's one thing that I like to do with my work is not just keep it sort of one-dimensional. It can sort of, um, yeah, like be a video, be a photograph, be an activation, be a sculpture. It can kind of have a life in all of these kind of facets of the art world. Yeah. And Nicole, I think we might just get Lynn to flick through a couple of these images so people can see the um, work as a video projection and yep. as it being installed, which is so evocative because you can really see how the work changes in those different spaces as well. I think is really amazing and then you actually you could you could see you <laughs> actually sort of nearly ready to perform <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then we're now looking at some of your public artwork on screen and this is part of a foyer work um in Sydney um in that you made in 2015 so I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about this piece it looks sure. an incredibly complex process that you've um, gone through to make this piece. Yeah, this was a great piece. This is um, called Marina Gurang, and that means um, large country. Um, and it was made in collaboration with an elder, Uncle Charles Madden, uh, and also Urban Future Organisation. So they're an architectural firm. And we all worked together to make this really special piece. So. Um, it was really interesting, you know, a lot of the time we were sort of working in that sort of two-dimensional space when we're asked to do murals and things. But what we wanted to do was a piece on rock art. Um, Charles was very interested in the rock art and he's been quite an advocate for, um, for that um, to become highlighted around the Sydney area. It's, you know, it's known as the biggest outdoor gallery in the world. So Charles was always sort of an advocate for the rock art, but we didn't just want to place the rock art sort of on the wall as this kind of static um, piece. What we wanted to do was sort of bring the wall out and create that rock sort of facade. And then the rock, the it's it's actually engravings that we have over that are over there in the Sydney area. So what we wanted to do then was 
use that similar technique and then engrave back into the face of the rock. So, another, you know, and, and Charles drew all of the imagery and told the story. So the story of this piece, it starts on the left-hand side and it's about the ocean on that side and, um, and the headlands and then there's the whale and some fish on that side and then there's a man standing there to welcome you and then travel you sort of across country and go hunting for some kangaroos and then you end up uh, in Redfern which is, has the totem of the goanna so then there's the goannas at there towards the end so we all work together to be able to make this work a reality and you can see there there's two sides to the work so we um we had one side that we 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 used actually it was um fsc um plywood so it was one of the main um objectives of this uh, this piece was to remain as eco-friendly as we could and sustainable so it was all fsc um plywood we then came up with a fixing system that meant we didn't have to use any glues or any um, screws. So it would just um, basically slot in and hold itself in place. Um, so it was just a very um, clever program that we used to be able to, you know, CFC cut all of those. And um, and then it was some eco paint that we got from Mirabond as well. So. As much as we could, we made this as um, eco-friendly as we could because that was just that was basically this very simple palette of um, materials. But it was using, you know, computer programming that was quite high tech to be able to come out with all of these paneling. And then, you know, we installed that as well. This was this was quite a while ago too. So I was very much hands on in this project, installing and painting, and yeah, it was it was a lot of work. <laughs> But I think, you know, in the end it really um, showcased the culture of the area just so beautifully and, we yeah, there's still people talk about these projects today. So it's a we really also <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we also do an information panel with it as well so that people can have a little bit more uh, information about, you know, about the work and about um, the rock art around the area. So, yeah. Thanks, Nicole. And I think we'll go on to the next slide now, which I think is a really interesting um, work. And this is kind of, I think there's a bit of inspiration for the work that you've made that we'll get to show next year from this work a little bit as well. I feel like um, this it's called Sitting Together. And I'm just interested in if you could tell us about where this work was presented and mm -hmm. was it an interactive work? Did you, do people engage and sit down into this work? Mm -hmm. So this work was developed with the Australian Design Centre and um, Terry Winter was my mentor for this as well from Top 3 Design. Um, and the, the work was based around a story that I was told from an elder over here in Yamaji country and it was a story about my great-great-grandmother being uh, renowned for this kangaroo tail strip. And I wanted to tell this story and be able to, uh, you know, have a conversation with people about it, but I'm quite terrible in the kitchen. So I thought <laughs> the best way to do this was to use my design skills and um, come up with a way that I could tell this story. So there was actually um, three pieces, which I think are further on in the slide, but we can get to that. And, but and basically the first one started with the kangaroo, which was Wobbin. Wubbin Wubbin or Bounce and then it was about the boomerang or the hunter going out to get the kangaroo so that was Wallanu and then there's this one which is Ninjamana and it um, it means sitting together. So um, this particular work was an interactive work. It was a work where all of them were actually interactive. I, they were never to be just um, sort of looked at part of the these um, works were that you felt something when you engage with them. So this particular um, work I actually had in the centre there. You can see there's um, some knitting and there's some weaving in there. So the the weaving was with Lamandra, which was just actually um, 
picked from right out the front of the Australian Design Centre. <laughs> and then there was <laughs> some uh, wild wallaby yarn as well in there. And it was to sort of talk about the similarities uh, and the differences between our cultures. So the obviously the knitting, um, we were creating this kind of square kind of um, little patches uh, and a lot of people know how to knit and then with the weavings we were creating these sort of circular um, bracelet sort of things as well which could um, be joined together. So it was about creating this sort of similarity because all cultures around the world um, have a type of weaving and then also to be like the application of that can be different but we still have those really strong links that can bind us together. So the work was really quite low and down, quite close to the ground. So when you sort of sat in this work, you kind of became in a little bit of a bubble because you were just that little bit lower than sort of eye height or the gaze. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason those works in the middle was so that people would start to sort of interact with each other and if you'd forgotten how to do something or you wanted to learn something that people could then ask each other and on the opening night it worked perfectly I mean all these kind of activations and things you never know quite how anything is going to go until people are actually in the space and what they do and how they react but everyone was picking it up and people were teaching each other and there was children learning and yeah it was quite a wonderful sort of experience so Again, with these works, we were focused on sort of the sustainability. So it was Tasmanian blackwood um, in there and uh, and steel. So it was a very sort of strong finish. So for longevity, and then there's the kangaroo uh, pelt rug, which is underneath it as well. So, yeah, we try to keep everything sort of as native as we can. And also this entire work was made um, locally. And I think what's really interesting is that if we go into the next works as well that um, come onto the next image, I think what's really interesting is that um, we can see that like this, there's this element of furniture design, which is in, you know, as part of the festival um, design fringe that we're part of um, at the Melbourne Fringe Festival, furniture and design has been this really long tradition in Melbourne. And I think what's really fabulous is the connection between both cultures in your design. So the first one that's on the screen is called Bounce and then the second one um, is called Boomerang. You were just talking about them before. Mm -hmm. Has design always been part of your practice or has it been, is it, is it, how's that sit with you do you think? Yeah, I think design has always been a part of my life is probably where it kind of sits. When I was um, quite young, I remember my dad building our first house we sort of lived in the house while while well, on site while it was being built and then when they built their next one I was about seven and so I remember seeing these plans and them sort of toiling over what to do and how to do it and what was going to go where and then we, we obviously went and built that one and lived on site there again so I watched these um ideas uh, that were then sort of drawn onto paper come into reality. And I was the basically the cement mixer for that one, mixing all the mortar. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, you know, working on site as well. So I think I've always been really inspired by my parents. My mum's always been very creative as well uh, in painting and making things for the house, like lead lights and things like that. So she's always been very um, full on and just I think that, just that design sort of process of having an idea, sketching and nutting it out and then actually bringing something into reality or into the built environment has just been something that I've watched from a very young age. Yeah. Um, it, I think it's really stunning. We'll go on to the next slide, which is really some work that we're um, – that you did in 2018 for Sculpture by the Sea in Bondi. Mm -hmm. And it's this is an overhead shot and I think we'll move to the next slide which will give people a kind of indication of just the way in which people could interact with this work which is phenomenal in terms of just that really and I love this beautiful kind of circular element around the work of people coming together 
to come and talk and connect with people. If we go to the next slide as well. I think this is where I'd like you to start talking about how this becomes <laughs> a performative <laughs> element as well. Yeah. So this work was huge. It was about 20 metres in diameter and there was between six to seven tonne of timber that we actually moved down um, to Tamrama Beach. So uh, for the work. So it was a humongous undertaking. Um, the work came from the, again, a conversation with um, Charles Madden um, about the rock art that was in Bondi and it's actually right on the headland there for everybody to see and it's quite, in some ways it's great that some people don't really know it's there just, you know, because people are worried about vandalism but also the pathway that they've built actually covers over a section of it. So. I, yeah, anyway, it's it's right there. People run past it every day and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's right there, this sort of, you know, Aboriginal culture is right under the nose of everybody there and they, they don't even kind of see it. So we really wanted to um, highlight the connection that Aboriginal people have had to Bondi, you know, since the beginning of time. And um, this was one way that we could really... Um, bring that to life so there is one particular um piece up there which the there was quite a sort of a, a a conversation about whether it was a whale or a shark because it was the size of a whale but it had gills and things that were um on the side of it and then I asked one of the elders Alan Madden and he said it's a whale shark and which was really interesting to me because the whale sharks actually come to you know to this country over here or to Yamaji country and this is where they um come every year and they spend a lot of time here there's only a couple of places in the world they're very mysterious creatures the whale shark and so um we basically did the whale shark to the scale of what the largest one could be on the beach in Tamarama and we started talking about, you know, if this actually could be a whale shark. And it came about that there was actually, is that my line? No. Um, it came about that there'd actually been a beaching of a whale shark on Bear Island at La Perouse in the 60s. And then again, um, some Bondi people uh, snorkeling had seen one in 2013 and there was all these memories of these whale sharks and so then we were super fascinated that you know mob had seen whale sharks and then carved it up there on the headland so we did this work it was a collaborative work between myself uncle charles madden chrissy townsend and Teresa gay and it also paid homage to um, the La Perouse fires, so well, I should say um, bonfires, <laughs> they which they'd have on the street. They were quite renowned. There was a there's a big area in between um, the houses over there, in between um, the, on, in the streets, and every year they used to have huge bonfires over there. So we wanted to bring back the fire, the elemental kind of nature of the work, and really. Um, you know, also gives the next generation, the kids of Sydney, a connection to fire, like such an elemental thing that I know I connected with so much as a child going to, you know, someone's property that had a bonfire. It was one of the most exciting things that um, we ever did see. So we, um, yeah, so we thought there was many reasons why this was a, a – a really good work to try to make happen. There was quite a few hurdles. I mean, you can imagine, you can see there that we have fire on the beach. That number one was like a huge, huge <laughs> thing. It's like surrounded by sand and also water, which are both, you know, very good at putting out fires. But nonetheless, it was quite a struggle to get this happening. But, um, you know, it was it was something that I think really brought the community together. So, we um we made we made this the structure of the whale by um putting the pieces of timber basically they were just uh 
stacked one on the other one on the other and we had to yeah it was just it was a lot of work but we um we all went up all the people that were involved in it we all went up to where the actual whale shark um engraving is on the headland and we all took some time just to connect and um you know give some respect to a mob that had been there and had sat out there and looked out beyond the horizon for so many many decades and up there so we we did that and that wasn't part of the sculpture by the sea that was just something for us to do and that's why I say these um these aren't performative works, they're activations because we're not there performing for anybody. Um, we're, we're there practising culture and we're activating the space in a way that we hope, you know, continues the culture that has been in that place for such a long time. And uh, this work, I think, really did connect with the wider community in that sense. I mean, I've been down to Tamarama many times and I always wonder where the people are on their balconies because I'm like, this is the most beautiful view out here and I always scared and I could see maybe one person out on their balcony. Well, that night the, every balcony along Tamarama was absolutely chocked with everyone out on their balconies sort of looking at this sort of whale shark and appreciating the sort of elemental nature and the culture that was being practised down there. So. Yeah, it was really, really amazing to be able to work with everyone to bring that work to life. It's really incredible um, and really powerful work. If we connect, if we go over to the next slide, um, we're starting to um, look at some some new work, which is Sculpture by the Sea in Western Australia, which you mm. did some work in 2019. And I think it's... Um, this was a really large public art space piece, along with a, you know, a um, activation of culture and and cultural practices. And I'm just wondering if you could talk about this experience as well. Mm, sure. So, if just jump to the next slide, I think that one will be. Yeah, here it is. Um, so this was on Cottesloe Beach again, a collaboration with Chrissy Townsend, Sharon Egan, David Leha, and Janine Boree. So this one was about star stories, and again, just making visible those things that are right under people's noses, but they may not have ever engaged or taken the time to. Um, really even think about, you know, Aboriginal people being the first astronomers in the world. So we again um, reached out to community around Australia and um, people who are happy to share their star stories and we um, we activated this space again with, um, with, <laughs> with, oh, my gosh, I can't even remember how many people there was probably about 30 I think of us there maybe 40 even and it was all intergenerational um so there was tiny little kids to our you know elders there and they were welcoming you know opening and welcoming us to the work as well so this um the main stories I think that came with the stars this sort of uh, investigation of the star stories was emu in the sky and the seven sisters so we use that as kind of a springboard to sort of just start um, the conversations about. So there was an emu foot you can see in the middle of that work and then we had um, these emu feather stars. So if you just skip to the next one, you might be able to see. The, so they were the, the stars um, and basically they were things that could be interacted with. So you could spin those, jump through them, roll them along. You could um, really interact with them. And we had something every day, a certain time, I think it was an hour when kids could come down and they could play around with them and have a, have a great time and just sort of learn more about the star story. So we had this kind of um, looping uh, audio that would tell these stories so people could, um, yeah, just get, gain a bit of knowledge when they came down to the space as well. Yeah, and we had a, we had a special song made by David Leha for this one, which was really, really beautiful. Yeah. And I think if we go over the next couple of slides, we can see yeah. 
there's the activation. So yeah, we had um we had Billy Mac there in the middle and he was sort of leading us through that. And um yeah, after he'd sort of opened the space, then everyone sort of moved around the space. And there was a lot of people there listening and sort of learning. So it was quite wonderful. But yeah, it was there was a lot of us from New South Wales that had come over for that and then a lot of people were over here from Western Australia. So it was a really lovely sort of coming together. Yeah, my elder LV Dan was there, so that was wonderful. Mm. And if we can go to the next slide, I think. Yeah, so you can see there people holding those stars and wearing them and there was cloaks as well that you could wear. So we were just, yeah, it was a it was a beautiful, beautiful evening and everyone was just quite empowered by the end of it. I know LV, my elder, said she'd never seen the children be able to be so proud of their culture as they could on that night. So that, I think, for me was like a very big sort of moment. Yeah. And such a beautiful memory, I think, to share with your community as well. So, such beautiful images. And if we can go to the next slide, please, Lynn. This work um, is work that you made last year for a commission mm -hmm. at um, Westmead Hospital in Sydney, mm -hmm. and it's called mm -hmm. Connection Top Country. Um, and it's a series, I guess, of outdoor sculptural work and I'm wondering if we could, maybe we'll flip through a couple of images and then um, Nicole will get you to describe the process in this project. Sure. Yeah, so this project was, um, it was, uh, I think it was, there was three of us that were selected to put in a, um, a concept for this one. And I put in the concept for uh, Water Sky and earth uh and wanted to what we're developing like a suite around the whole site that kind of developed those ideas and wove them through in a really kind of um integrated way so um we worked i worked very closely with charles davidson so an elder who had a connection to that place and um yeah we worked through um how to make this sort of a reality so that picture that you can see there, that's the top of um, of a shade structure. All of those leaves and flowers that are in that, interwoven into that shade structure are actually taken, uh, were images that were taken from site of the plants that were there and then we um, sketched over those images and actually, you know, put it there as a sort of permanent kind of <laughs> reference to the plants that were from that place it was during the bushfires so there was a lot of like yeah it was a lot of really sadness about the plants and the animals at that time so it was really nice to be able to sort of pay homage to the plants that had grown on that site for such a long time and all the change they'd seen and um then we also worked with a um a linguist so if you just flick back to the first one of those um, the shade structure, you can start to see, um, you'll see the sort of shape of it. And the shape of it was taken from, well, got inspiration from the Camaragal, um mob, an image that they had that was drawn um, back during sort of the first colonisation sort of period. And it was, uh, you know, quite angular, structured, um, form and so we took sort of inspiration from that to create the shape of that and then below that we worked really closely with the landscape architects who had um who had designed a sort of a seat so if you just scoop back to the first image in that sort of suite i'm not sure we can go back in this oh, one where really? lives yeah but oh. let me <laughs> See, otherwise I think if we go one slide forward. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's, underneath, that's underneath the awning. But basically we worked with a linguist and we cut the foreshore into the side of the seat and then along the edge of that uh, we came up with whole sentences. So we wanted to start 
um, you know, developing the language past just singular words. So we, we worked with the linguist to come up with sort of doing things like, um, you know, that were related to the water. So women fishing in canoes with their babies, you know, things like that that, um, you know, had a lot of meaning to people that would have lived there. And then we also worked up this piece, which is about 40 metres long underneath the uh, the awning or, yeah, o- of the Royal North Shore Hospital as you come into this um, building, which says Cam- Camaragal, um today, tomorrow, no, yesterday, today and tomorrow. So it's... Um, it's all illuminated and it just looks so beautiful down there. And the it was it was a really interesting process because uh, at first I wanted to put um, always was always will be Aboriginal land, and um, it was to go in the uh, in the flooring there. But uh, people saw that as a political kind of statement. And they weren't so keen on it and I almost pulled out of the whole project because I thought that (laughs) it wasn't a political statement, it was just factual. (laughs) And um, But Charles, yeah, being the lovely gentleman that he is, you know, said, look, there's ways we can still, you know, have our message. And and it actually became much stronger by having it in language. So and then it went from the ground because on the ground they'd picked a crazy paver that actually couldn't be engraved in and then we suggested that we put it up underneath the facade so um it actually the viewpoint of it actually became a lot more readable because of the size of it and it's all mirrored and so it has this really nice interaction where it sort of has this sort of uh, life to it when people are walking underneath it and then obviously at night it really sort of comes alive with that side illumination which is something we really had to push push a lot for so but in the end everyone was very happy with that and I think it's a really nice statement piece there yeah it's incredibly strong and powerful work and I love the fact that it welcomes people into a space that is often you know, if you're going into hospital, it's not your best day often. It's often no. <laughs> a really challenging day and that there is such beautiful language um, shining above you I think is a really, um, really strong and powerful sentiment in your practice. And I'm now wondering if we can talk about the work that was commissioned for, um, oh, there's one more image here actually. Um, and if we can go to the next one, please, Lynn. These are some of the images that um, you've taken as kind of inspiration for the work um, that yeah. um, you've made for us, which really is about that connection to country. And it's such beautiful country. I know when we've had the chance to talk to you over the last four months or so, um, Juliet, our curator, and myself have often been very jealous of your life <laughs> because you'll turn the phone around and show us this incredible red dirt, <laughs> amazing blue sky, and here's your little boy running along the side of the road. And we've been stuck at home in Melbourne thinking, <laughs> I know who's having the best life. Um, I remember one day you were telling us that you were going off to swim with um, a shark. Uh, the whale sharks. It the whale been. sharks. Yeah. Yeah. And we were like, yeah, definitely having a better life. Um, <laughs> I'm really interested um, about the kind of way in which this trip onto country has really inspired this um, work. Um, and we were so excited when we first saw your work when you submitted work for the Design Fringe Com- um, Commission. So could mm. you tell us a little bit about the materials that you've used and how that draws upon Indigenous practices? Yeah, so I think one of the really lovely things about being back on country has been really connecting with the place in a way that you just can't when you don't live live there. So um my son and I have had really amazing days where we'll just collect kangaroo's teeth, you know, <laughs> or, or we'll go and collect um, grass tree resin or we'll collect reeds for weaving, you know. And he'll often, you know, as we're walking along, you know, start pointing things out or start collecting things now. But it's um it's been an absolutely lovely practice and 
that intergenerational, that connection, that, uh, you know, the actual taking, well, the actual sort of gathering of things from the environment that then can become part of your everyday is um, not something that I think we do every day. Um, so when we were out and um, collecting these uh, objects, the one of the really interesting things that struck me was that, you know, there's a lot of um, cultural practice wrapped up in this gathering and creating. And so walking out, finding, you know, finding these places where these things might be, like finding where the grass trees are, and then finding the resin, you know, and gathering that and making sure that of the quality of the resin and like learning about all of these things and then, you know, finding the kangaroos and then figure, you know, finding, you know, the, the teeth and then, you know, using those in the practice. But like just walking along, you know, and I'm sure Mob would have been, you know, traversing across, you know, Across the land at certain times to get to those materials so that because with the grass tree the 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 resin comes out when there's been a fire and so the fire has to go through at a certain temperature in a certain season so that the resin comes out so once that had happened or you know or mob i guess could have um, made the fire happen at that season then they could collect the collect the resin so there's a lot that um, would go on with the connection of people and place and the togetherness of making after you've collected those things and the stories that would get passed down. And, yeah, so I just started thinking a lot about, about, about that practice and how I could bring some of these things into my home because I was like, how can I bring some of these things into my home? And then you know, especially in this sort of, um, you know, the context of the world that we live in today, you know, the, you know, where we use like, um, you know, plates and knives and forks and, you know, bowls and all of these sort of things. And then I started sort of playing around with some resin. Um, another a very good friend of mine, Sharon Egan, does a lot with the resin as well. So, she's been doing a lot of painting and things and I thought, oh, I wouldn't mind doing some sculptural things. So I started to have a little play with it and I made these sort of little mini utensil things and I'd made some little mini bowls um, out of them and then I thought, oh, maybe I could make something bigger and I could make some, you know, spoons and knives and forks and little things that could could go along with that and kind of again it's this kind of cross-cultural kind of connection across you know um my identity where I sort of sort of start jamming things together again to sort of look at them with fresh eyes and in a new way and try to find those similarities and the differences between our cultures and so I started um yeah I started making these little forks with the kangaroo's teeth you can see on the screen there and some spoons with these beautiful shells that had um, been washed ashore during there was um, there was quite a big um, cyclone up here and so quite a lot of the bigger shells had um, had come to shore so I collected some of those with Biddy and um, yeah and there was some bones as well I used some of the bones from the kangaroos that I'd found and I collected the sinew out of the tail and I used that as well which was an amazing material I found that to be a really um yeah really interesting it could be very stiff and then it could you could put it in water and it would um it would go back to being very very pliable and then you could bind it and it would uh tighten and hold things quite remarkably so you can see around the ends of those um, shells I've sort of bound those together with the sinew which was really interesting so I've been learning a lot during this whole sort of process and sort of pushing materials I guess in ways that I hadn't really thought of before in particular making this really large bowl that <laughs> out of resin that I was to place as the centerpiece to this work um, which I really had probably quite, a, I had quite a struggle to make sure that it, um, 
it worked because the resin is such an interesting material. So there's some little examples. The little ones seem to work fine. It was really getting it <laughs> uh, at that larger scale. So um, basically the resin or the grass tree resin is a thermoplastic. So that means that when you heat it up, it goes um, basically to almost like a toffee kind of consistency. And then you ground down charcoal, which basically helps the heat move around. And then also kangaroo scat, which is basically just like grass or it's just a fiber. So you grind those all down together and then mix it all up. And what it creates is basically um, a fiberglass. So you have the, obviously the fiber is the same thing you get in fiberglass and then the, um, the heating of it and the cooling down of the resin. So it's actually like a, a super, super innovative material that Mob were using to, um, to hold their tools together and bind things like fishing hooks and things and um, orna ornament, ornamental kind of belongings as well. So, um, yeah, so I sort of threw my hat in the ring for the design fringe and thought, I'd um, give that a go and see what I could uh, make happen. And it was very much an experiment for me. It, it ended up, I was very happy with the results in the end, but it really did take quite a lot of work. And so you can see there on the left in that image, there were the little, um, the little pieces that I first started playing around with. And I was, I'd found an echidna on Wiradjuri country on the way over. And so I was using those little echidna um, spines to, to do those first works and then on the right is just a little snippet <laughs> of what the larger work will look like that will go into um yeah the linda new art space next year and nicole one of the really interesting things is that um that you've sent to us um you know earth and sand as well as sort of like the mm. cuttings of grass trees and charcoal to install um yeah. install the work and we're really interested in in that process and, and why that kind of grounding is really important to be presenting the work yeah for me i just think it's really important like place and space and connecting with the earth in this way i think just it makes me feel it, it centers me again and i think there's a lot um to be said about that for a lot of people i think in particular you know when we're going through all of these uh you know lockdowns and things like that we're really i think realizing how important that connection to country really is and these you know this is kind of gives people sort of opportunities to be able to understand country and other people's country in other ways you know i think you know when you look at that red earth you know that it's from a different place you know mm -hmm. and you can kind of um sort of start to imagine what that place is like and the Yamaji country over here is so diverse. There's, I mean, you saw the images of the the beaches over here and then, you know, there's right where we are right now in Kalbarri, it's like red, red um, rock that just hits the ocean, you know. So it's very different to the East Coast and very different to, uh, you know, down near Melbourne as well. So it's... um. I think it's really important for people to understand the diversity of this country as well and the diversities of cultures of this country as well. So um, this, yeah, this piece, it does have some similarities to Ninjmana, the, mm -hmm. the sitting together. But, um, yeah, I think this one was more about sort of getting into those finer details of people um, coming together and sort of eating together. I've got that bowl in the centre, this big kind of communal bowl on this way of sort of communally eating together. And then we have the, you know, the little utensils and I've, you know, mapped out the places for people to sit. And one of them's a little bit smaller because it's a little, you know, a little person. And I think that intergenerational um, thing is something that I really like to bring into my work, especially, you know, because Biddy was part of this work, a part of collecting it all, a part of um, 
you know, foraging and gathering. And it's one of, it's one thing that brings, you know, me so much joy in my practice is to be able to do these things with my son and see the joy that he, he gets from them. As you're talking about that, I'm reminded of like when my mum, when my brothers and I used to walk and go and do things with my mum, before we hopped in the car, she'd make us empty our pockets of all the seed pods and rocks (laughs) and things that we, and we were allowed to choose one that we could keep. (laughs) Um, Nicole, I'm really interested in what's happening next. What's the next kind of things that you've got coming up in your practice? Well, um, we've actually, I've been working with Yamaji Arts and the Geraldton Regional Art Gallery over here and we've just opened um, an exhibition as part of the Craft Triennial over here. So anyone in Geraldton who's out there or in Western Australia, if you're coming up here, that's just opened last week. So that'll be on for the next few weeks and that's about... um, sort of reigniting the cultural practice of making the kangaroo skin bags that our mob have made since, you know, time immemorial and learning more and allowing people to learn more about, you know, the skills and techniques and, you know, all of those wonderful things that mob have been doing. So that's here. I'm also working a lot with um, with my public art company, Millie Millie. So that's really um finding a lot of traction at the moment we've got a oh I've got a really big project with that that I'm not allowed to talk about <laughs> so <Damn>. unfortunately, <laughs> I know sorry <laughs> but um yeah there's always so many different projects that I'm working on or being asked to sort of work on so at the moment though I'm this week I'm meant to be on holiday so I'm trying to just relax a little bit but um yeah, I'll be back in um, Geraldton and I'll be getting back into the Millie Millie stuff, I think, next week. And, um, yeah, I've been working on a few collaboratives with the design and then, um, yeah, I'll be happily getting – I'll have a studio hopefully when I get back there now because we've been on the – I've been on the road since April. So I actually made this work, um, you know, for the design fringe and Linden Art uh, on the road. So that was quite challenging in many ways. I know, and I'll just I'll pick up the bowl because I've got um, because when we we were hoping to show the the work, um, this is the bowl, and you can see there's almost like the amazing kind of um, as it catches the light, the little patterns of resin that have been created. So it's got this beautiful pattern inside it. It almost looks like the petals on a flower mm. that have been mm. um, connected, and it just feels amazing feels so beautiful I just want to keep touching it it's got that really tactile (laughs) feeling what's it like to work with the resin I would say is one of the most difficult materials that I've worked with (laughs) I had more challenges with um that material than anything else I think I've worked with so it just you know, it makes me have a lot more appreciation for mob and, you know, how they would have been making things and the way they would have made things would have had to, you know, there would have been a lot of learning in that process because for me I was, you know, using um, a gas stove some of the time and I was, you know, finding it quite difficult. It's very hot and so I would I would heat it up and that's why it's made from little pieces. I would heat it up and um, make a ball I'd make a ball and then I would squash that ball down and then um, basically adjoin, adjoin it into the other piece. So, it's yeah, it is made from smaller little pieces all sort of joining together. And, yeah, I sort of, you know, I had a few little injuries on my fingers from burns and things. But <laughs> all, um, yeah, all for a good cause, I think. So um, it's absolutely stunning work and we can't wait to get it into the gallery um and install it next year um one of those things is as we were preparing for the show we got the work sent to my home so that i could make sure that it was it was going to arrive safely nicole thank you for sharing all your knowledge and um just the amazing work that you have made over the period that you've been practicing for it's just incredible it's a privilege to talk to you this afternoon and I really really hoping that next year um, you'll be able to be um, in Melbourne 
so we can have you at the opening and, and celebrate the work in real <laughs> life. So thank you very much. Um, before we finish up today, I'd like to thank the team at the Melbourne Fringe Festival and our fabulous Design Fringe supporters who've made this possible. The City of Port Phillip, Creative Victoria, the Naomi Milgram Foundation, the Victorian Women's Trust, our education partner program, Monash University. So Nicole, thank you. We look forward to catching up very shortly over the phone, I'm sure again, um, before we hopefully have you in Melbourne next year. I'd really like to thank our interpreters, um, yes. Paul and Mark, who have been signing for us. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for our audience joining us today. It's been lovely to have you um, and um, be part of this um, event. And I'm just going to bring a couple of... Um, I also want to just share for people who are really interested in finding a little bit more about Nicole, your website, nicolemonks.com. Mm -hmm. You can find a whole range of amazing work there and we look forward um, to you be able to um, go and explore a little bit more work. So thanks, everyone, for joining us and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, Melinda. Thanks, Mark and Paul. Bye. Bye.